This is Theology for Teens with Nathan LaValle. Thanks for hopping on this YouTube video or podcast today. Before we dive into covering the topic, which is the final three laws of logic, I want to tell you a story from this past week. I was waiting for someone. We were going to be getting lunch together. And while I was waiting for this person, I was working on my computer. I was at this restaurant. And on the back of my computer, I have a big sticker. It says, ask me about Jesus. It takes up all the real estate on the back of my laptop. And usually... When I'm working in public and I'm working on my computer, someone will take me up on this. Usually it's a believer. Usually it's someone who also professes faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's not. This time, it was someone who worked at the restaurant who, who came up to me and said, I'm a fellow uh, follower of Jesus too. Uh, Jesus is my homeboy. And so I'm like, great, I get to have a conversation with someone. And so I said, oh, well, that's awesome. How long have you been a believer for? And this individual started telling me about how they just got out of a drug rehab program. And then they went on to say that the Jesus they worship might be a little different than the Jesus I worship, which that statement is interesting in and of itself. As a realist, I would say there's one Jesus. And although we have lots of conceptions of Jesus and certain parts about who Jesus actually is jumps out more to different people than others. I would say we're all worshiping the same Jesus. So I asked her, I said, well, what do you mean by that? That's a very interesting statement. She said, well, I believe that Jesus is Lucifer. I believe that Revelation, the end of Revelation says that Jesus is the bright and morning star and that that means that Jesus is in fact Lucifer. I said, that's very interesting. So what do you do with uh, Matthew chapter four that talks about Jesus being tempted? She says, well, that's Satan. That's different. I said, okay, so you don't think Satan and Lucifer are the same thing? I said, no. Uh, I think Jesus is Lucifer, and I think Satan is within all of us. Really? You think Satan's within all of us? She said, yeah, I think Jesus is within all of us too. I said, okay, that's very interesting. So Jesus was being tempted by himself in chapter 4? And so we got going on this conversation, and eventually she just said, um, hey, I prayed to God. Uh, I was affirmed in this belief, uh, you know, no one's going to be able to convince me otherwise. And I said, well, okay, where did you hear this from at first? And she comes and she brings me a book that talks about this, uh, this theory. It's very interesting. You know, just if you're listening to this, the interesting thing to take note of is that Lucifer, the idea of Lucifer would have been in reference to, to Venus. And so people would refer to kings that kind of were rising to this prominent status. Occasionally in antiquity, they would refer to them by this title. And in Isaiah, we have one of these examples where uh, the word that would have been translated from another language, probably into Hebrew as, as Lucifer, is mentioned. And it's in reference to a certain particular king. It wasn't until after um, the New Testament was written that some church fathers began teasing out the idea that maybe Lucifer and Satan were the same, because uh, in Luke, Jesus says that Satan fell from heaven. And in particular, this other passage in scripture that talks about Lucifer, this king, um, this morning star, doing a similar thing. So it's actually not really relevant. Um, the idea, though, would be, in, in this lady's mind, would be that Lucifer uh, was an angel, and so was Jesus. There's problems with that. There's big problems with that because if Jesus is a created entity, then he wasn't the word at the beginning with God and was God, which is John 1. It also has issues with the way we see Jesus in Colossians. And so this lady really did have a different conception of Jesus. She was right. The question is, is her conception of Jesus well-grounded in evidence? And for that, of course, we would use logic. We would make arguments and we would evaluate the evidence for the premises of that argument to know whether or not we are indeed believing something that is more likely to be true than more likely to be false. This story is great because it actually highlights something we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be looking in just a little bit about a scripture. We're going to be looking at a scripture that utilizes the new kinds of logic that I'm going to be introducing to you this week with Law 7, 8, and 9. Before we do that, I'm just going to quickly blow through um, last week. Again, I want to re-go through that so that I can refresh you on that, and then we'll dive in. So last week, we introduced the concept of and in logic. 
we introduced the idea of and. It's symbolized by the little squiggly and symbol. Law 4 specifically states that if A is true and B is true, then A and B are true. So if A is true, B is true, then we can say A and B. And that's a conclusion we can arrive at from the premise A and then the premise B. This is important because sometimes we need A and B in order to get to another place. So maybe we we need to get to this place where we go, if A and B, then C. And this example I actually have up on the screen on YouTube. A is that breakfast is my favorite meal. B is that lunch is my second favorite meal. And then we can conclude A and B. Breakfast is my favorite meal and lunch is my second favorite meal. And maybe I want to make an argument that dinner is my least favorite meal. Well, I need A and B to do that. If A and B, then C. Dinner is my least favorite meal. This is law four. It's pretty intuitive. Law five does something a little bit different. It asserts A and B. A and B is true. From this, we can conclude A and we can also conclude B. This is really important. When we say A and B, what we're saying is that both of these are true. In other words, there's three ways for A and B to be false. A and B put in parentheses. One, A could not be true. Two, B could not be true. And three, A and B could each individually not be true. These are three different ways that a simple A and B, in parentheses, could be untrue. So the way to notate this, make it really clear, is to put A and B in parentheses and put the negation outside of the parentheses. So here we know, because of this concept of A and B, that both of them have to be true for A and B to be true. So therefore, we can pull away A and we can pull away B. Sometimes we need just B to make progress in the argument. Sometimes we might need just A to make progress in the argument. So it's useful to know that if A and B is true, then just A is true, and we can move forward with that. Finally, law six is kind of more of a housekeeping rule. In fact, you may never use this. In law six, we assert that uh, if A, then B, and then from that we conclude if A, then A and B. In other words, inherent in um, the assertion of if A, then B is the assertion that if A is indeed true, then not only is B true, but also A is true. And that's the essence of and in logic. And so we can say if A, then A and B. This is a housekeeping rule. I don't know that you would really need this rule, but it's important. It's one of the nine fundamental laws of propositional logic. But again, more of a housekeeping rule. You could probably work your way around most arguments without this particular one. Now this week, we're introducing the concept or in logic. And or, we are going to actually symbolize with a V. This is how we're going to notate the concept of or in logic. So if we were trying to say A or B, we would go A with a V and then B. And I put spaces between these to, to make it look right in my head at least. So let's go ahead and take a look at a passage in scripture that specifically utilizes or in making a logical argument. And we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians 11.3 through 2 Corinthians 11.4. If you want to pull that up on a Bible, in an app, you can do that. I'm going to go ahead and read it here. I'm afraid, however, that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may be led astray from your simple and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims a Jesus other than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one you received, or a different gospel than the one you accepted, then you put up with it way too easily. This is 2 Corinthians 11, 3 through 4. And here we have an argument being made that utilizes or statements. Now, let's focus in on the second part of this, and I'll go ahead and notate this. So I'll read this part one more time. Take a listen. For if someone comes and proclaims a Jesus other than the one we proclaimed, or if you received a different spirit than the one you received, or a different gospel than the one you accepted, then you put up with it way too easily. And we'll notate this by doing parentheses and saying A or B or C. So if A or B or C, and then we do our arrow and we say then D. I like doing the parentheses here because it's, making clear that the A or B or C is all one unit. And there's something 
about logic and the way that we use or in our language that's just a little bit different from each other. So when we say or, we'll come back to this passage in just a moment. When we say or, what we're saying is actually the exact opposite of and, in a sense. Remember that with and, we just have A and B. There's three ways that and can be untrue, right? We can attack any individual component of that. Maybe A is not true. Maybe B is not true. Maybe both aren't true. So three separate ways. With or, there are three ways for A or B to be true. This is really important. So both A and B can be true. Or just A could be true. Or just B could be true. For all three of these different scenarios, the statement A or B is true. So for example, if I were to say, if my favorite sports team is playing, then I'm watching them on Fox or YouTube. Maybe those are the two places that I can watch these teams. Now, if I was watching on both of these statements, uh, on both of these te- uh, broadcast networks, Fox and YouTube, that statement would still be true. I am indeed watching on Fox or YouTube. So this is what I want to draw out because oftentimes in language, when we say or, what we really mean is to say um, A or not A. We'll get there in just a moment. In other words, we're trying to make a binary statement and saying that It's not possible for both of these to be true. It's either this one or it's that one. It's not both. In logic, that is not what we mean by or. And oftentimes in language, that's not what we mean by or. Really what we're saying is that if any part of this is true, maybe it's the A, maybe it's the B, maybe it's both of them, then A or B, the statement, put in parentheses, passes, and that is in and of itself true. So with this example from 2 Corinthians 11.4, we can actually pull something interesting out of this. We could see a way that if we didn't understand logic, we may misinterpret this passage, okay? So what the author of 2 Corinthians is saying is that there are three different things, A or B or C, that if any of them are true, then D is true. And D here is that the church in Corinth put up with These things, these people that brought these different things too easily, they weren't firm enough against these teachings or people. They weren't harsh enough about these things. They weren't serious enough. They weren't protective enough. And so you could come to this passage and maybe you'd go, um, yeah, I believe in the spirit that, that I received. I believe in the gospel that everyone else does. I do have a different conception of Jesus, but you know, and this is, I'm doing a hypothetical person here. Maybe, maybe this person would say, but I'm not doing all three of these. So I'm not making a mistake. I'm not putting up with it too easily. Well, logic wouldn't allow us to believe this. The idea here is that if any of these three are happening, then we are putting up with it too easily. Now, again, this is written to the church in Corinth, but I think there are universal truths that we apply as Christian believers today. These points are relevant, and it ties back into the conversation I had with this lady at the restaurant. So if someone proclaims a Jesus other than the one we proclaimed, this is an important concept in Scripture. We have to believe in the true Jesus. In fact, a false Christ cannot save. Now, none of us have a complete and full picture of Christ. We all have some kind of flaw. In fact, if we were to dive into talking about the different Christological heresies, different ways that people have believed incorrect things about Christ in early church history, we would see it's actually pretty easy to accidentally fall into incorrect belief about Jesus. The issue comes when you intentionally are presenting or believing a Christ, a Jesus, that is different than the one of Scripture different than the one that is actually put forward in the Gospels, different than the one that Paul was presenting to this church in Corinth as he writes 2 Corinthians. So this is relevant to the conversation that I had in this restaurant. This lady was presenting a different Jesus than the one that Paul proclaimed to the church in 2 Corinthians. and Or in, in Corinth, not the church in 2 Corinthians. And indeed, this lady was presenting a different Jesus than the one that is presented in Scripture. 
she's taking scripture and she's actually misinterpreting it and kind of, well, not kind of, really twisting who Jesus is. In that moment, I have a concern for her soul as a Christian. I want to make sure that the people that I interact with have reasonably good conceptions of who Jesus is because I am concerned that if someone has a really twisted picture of Jesus, that that may not have saving power. Now, it's not for me to decide. Um, It's for, for God to decide. I see places in scripture that make me go, I should be wise in trying to discern what people believe and go, is that true or not? And maybe convince them of what is true. But I'm not trying to play the role of God here. God knows and is the person who uh, is responsible for for what is salvation and what is not salvation. The point stands that this passage, even just that one issue of, of proclaiming a different Jesus, having a different Jesus, is a serious one. It's an or statement. It's not an and statement. They don't all have to be true for the statement to pass. Now, in addition, if you receive a different spirit than the one you received. So if it's not the Holy Spirit, and maybe it's a spirit of of wailing and falling on the ground, like we see in a lot of mega churches and a lot of really, really sensational churches. Um, and I don't mean sensational as a compliment. I mean um, sensational as, you know, making crazy, crazy things happen. Um, if that's different than the true spirit, um, than, than the one with which you received, that's serious too. And if it's a different gospel, in other words, if we're not being saved from eternal separation from God, right? Like the gospel, the good news is that we're given eternal life. If the, the good news is now being presented as something else, maybe it's that uh, God has the master plan for what it looks like to live a good life here and now, that that's, that's what the good news is. It's not about resurrection from dead. This is something that's expanded upon in Corinthians by Paul. That's a different gospel. The good news is different. So any of these three things would give pause for concern. And the idea is we should not put up with it easily. So I just want to show you the writers of scripture utilized logic and they utilized or. In fact, if you were to open up Bible software and you were to search the word a, this Greek word, uh, you could look at every usage of the word or and you could find all kinds of different places where statements this or this are made. And you could see how these rules we're about to learn apply. So that's it. Let's dive into these final three laws. They are intuitive. They are pretty simple to understand. And then we're going to look at one really prominent example of making an argument uh, from or. So law seven, here we go. All right. I'm going to assert the premise A. Here the premise A is I'm in Baton Rouge. From this... I will conclude A or B. So in this example, B is I'm in New Orleans. So I can conclude that if A is true, A or B is true, no matter what B is. This is really important. Remember that for A or B to be true, we only have to know that one of these is true. They don't both have to be true. And they don't even have to have any particular relationship to each other. So B here could be, you know, so let's say A is I'm in Baton Rouge, the city that I live in, and B is I am skydiving off of the Empire State Building tomorrow. Is A or B true? Well, I've asserted A is true. And so, yes, A or B is true. One of them is true. That's enough to go A or B is true. Sometimes um, we need to get to A or B to, to move forward in an argument. And so if we can show that one of the components is true, then it would be true that A or B is true. I think this is more of a housekeeping rule. It's more to reveal the nature of or, okay? If just one of them is true, then A or true is true, or A or or B is true. All right. Simple, hopefully. Intuitive. Some of these are kind of like last week where don't, or I'm going to say don't overthink them, okay? Some of them are just simple. Some of them are more simple than they seem like they should be. If A is true, then A or B is true, no matter what B is. Let's go ahead and look at law number eight. We'll move on here. In law number eight, we're going to assert A or B. So again, there's several ways for that to be true. A could be true. B could be true. Both could be true. And then from that, 
the second premise we're going to make is not A. Or maybe we're going to say not B. We're going to say not one of the two parts of the or statement. And then the conclusion we're going to make is that since that one's not true and A or B is true, then the other one is true. So if we go A or B and then we assert not A, it would follow that B has to be true. We could do the same thing the other way. This example I have on the screen is going to show us something important about or statements that I hinted at earlier. So let's go like this. I'm a boy or I'm a girl. That is indeed true. And then I'm going to assert, well, I'm not a girl. <laughs> and there's a lot of ways I know that to be the case. And then from that, what can I conclude? Well, I can conclude that I'm a boy. Now, there's a bit of an issue with this example. There's something tricky going on here. And that is this. The category of boy or girl is binary. Okay, you can be one, you can be the other, but you can't really be both. Even in fringe examples that people like to talk about, so we can look at this, we can look at intersex people, maybe they're born with male parts and female parts, their body is still codified at the genetic level, at the, the low, low level of DNA and chromosomes, their body is still codified as male or female, as boy or girl. And so... Here, we're expressing a binary, but with an or statement, you'll recall that both could be true. I'm a boy or I'm a girl. We're good there. The issue is that with this binary, they can't both be true. You can't be both a boy and a girl. And so we have a bit of a difficulty here, and I'm going to just tell you how you can go about this. So the tricky thing is A or B and I have this chart up on the screen that, that makes it helpful if you're able to see this. If both are true with A or B, that makes sense. Now, we can also notate this a different way. So we can have an or with two sides, and one side of the or is A and not B. The other side of the or is not A and B. So what this does is it makes it so that if both are true, that makes no sense at all because we're saying both A and not A. We're saying both B and not B. So this is a way of making an or statement that is binary. It's kind of a sloppy way of doing this. What might be better in examples where we have uh, binary or statements is actually to express them uh, with just one letter. So we might say A or not A. Now, the difficulty here is um, it does make language a little bit more confusing. With our previous example, I could say I'm a boy or I'm not a boy. Those are the two examples. And because we have A or not A, it, it doesn't make sense for both to be true. That's the law of non-contradiction. A and not A cannot be true at the same time. They can't. By definition, they can't be true at the same time. I'm a boy or I'm not a boy. Well, I'm not not a boy. See, this is where language can get a little confusing, but this would probably be the most proper way you could express a binary or statement. Uh, this one or that one, not both or statement. You would do it with A or not A. So I'll show you an example of this. God is either perfect or not perfect. Now, on the one hand, I could say God is either perfect or evil. You know, I could say something else that I'm going to have to prove more. The power of this binary statement of God is either perfect or not perfect is there's not another option. <laughs> God either is perfect or not perfect. There's not a third option of like kind of perfect. Well, that would be not perfect, <laughs> right? So this is useful. And then I might assert, well, God's not not perfect. I might draw on arguments of Plantinga, different people who have made the ontological argument could look that up. It's confusing. Maybe we'll talk about it someday. I hope not. Uh, it's, it's confusing. The idea is like in the definition of God is this idea of perfectness, maximally great being. And so we're going to, we're going to assert, well, God's not, not perfect. And from that, we can conclude because of law number eight, that God is perfect. So this is how we can express a binary in a more simple way. If we go back to this example of law eight with a boy and the girl, I might say, well, you're either a girl or you're not a girl. Are you a girl or are you not a girl? Well, I'm not a girl. Okay, so that means you're not a girl. 
This seems a little bit contrived. I'm going to show you after we go through these three laws, how this might be applied, how it can be really useful and how it actually is the grounding of one of the most prominent arguments for the deity of Jesus that we have. Finally, law nine. This one's a little bit more complicated. You could intuitively know this if you understand the first three laws well, because here we have an or statement and on each side of the or statement, we have a separate if then statement. So on one side, we have if A then B. On the other side, we have if C then D. So think about this. What are we asserting here with the or statement? What we're saying is that one of these if then statements is true or both of them are true. Three ways for this to be true, right? So we have if A or B, or sorry, if A then B, or if C then D. Put parentheses, make this easy on yourself. Parentheses, A, if A then B, into parentheses, and then the or, the V, and then do uh, parentheses, if C then D, into parentheses. So my example, I'll use city and state again. If I'm in Baton Rouge, then I'm in Louisiana, or if I'm in Dallas, then I'm in Texas. Okay, we have two options here. I am asserting that one of them at least is the case. Maybe both of them are. I actually had one of my youth volunteers last night. I love this. He pointed out, well, depending on how you define you, uh, you could have, you know, a toe in Baton Rouge and the rest of your body in Dallas, and then you could be in both. So maybe this isn't binary. And I love that. I love the creativity uh, there. And we, we do have to think that way when we evaluate um, evidence. For now, don't evaluate the evidence. Just look at this. So that's my first premise. One of these if-then statements is true, okay? Then I'm going to assert A or C. In other words, I'm in one of these cities. Okay, from this, we can conclude if, or sorry, not if, we can conclude B or D. Okay, we can conclude from I'm in Baton Rouge or I'm in Dallas that, well, I'm in Louisiana or I'm in Texas. This should be intuitive. You might need to pause the podcast. Just take a moment to think about this. The idea here is that or, if we do an or, we can have an if-then statement on each side and law one still applies. That's basically the idea of this here, okay? So that's good. We could also do this the other way. So we could say not B or not D. And from that, we could conclude not A or not C. So law two also applies when we have if then statements on either side of an or. I'm not sure how much you'll actually use this idea here. Um, hopefully you'll use it at some point and this isn't just dead information. I imagine that if you were to start making complicated arguments for things and really diving into topics, you might find a use for law number nine. So those are the final three laws of propositional logic and you've done it. You have graduated from the master class of propositional logic. Uh, we'll be moving on to some other things after this that are going to be really helpful. But before we do that, let me give an example of these or statements. So there's a really prominent argument that was popularized by C.S. Lewis. It was put forward by two people uh, before that, but it wasn't really popularized until C.S. Lewis brought this out in his writings. He said, if Jesus claims to be God, then he can only be one of two, three, or one of three things, Lord, liar, or lunatic. Now I'll go ahead and show you, there's this great graph I found online that, that actually shows this thought tree for this. So at the top of the thought tree, we have Jesus saying, I am God. Now, some people might want to fight you on that. So you would want to ask that first. Do you believe Jesus claimed to be God? you know, let them answer that. If they say yes, then we're in the problem. There's only three options is the idea of this argument. So one of the options is that Jesus was telling the truth. He really was God. He thought he was, and he was. And so the answer there would be that Jesus is Lord. Now on the false side, there's two ideas as well, or there's two ideas on the, the false side, not as well. There's two ideas. One is that Jesus was um, not God, and he knew he wasn't God. He was lying about that. He was insincere in what he said. The other option is Jesus was not God, but he thought he was God. So he is a lunatic. He's crazy. He thinks he's something that he's not. This is called the trilemma. This argument is called the trilemma. Some people have taken this further up the tree. So they've actually taken it all the way up to 
whether or not he existed. So if, if Jesus didn't exist, then he's a legend. And then they went, did he claim to be God? And if he didn't claim to be God, some people, like I said, will argue that. We could talk about that, but we won't just now. Then maybe he's just a leader. But if he did claim to be God, then there's these Lord, liar, lunatic categories. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and show you this argument uh, in a different form. I'll show you it verbally, and we're going to have or statements, and you're going to see how this works. And then I'll uh, we can go ahead and think about how you might notate this. So, premise one, if Jesus claimed to be God, then he was either a liar or a lunatic or the Lord. Okay? So, someone could concede this even if they didn't believe in Jesus. So, yeah, if Jesus did believe claim if Jesus did claim to be God, Jesus did claim to be the Lord, then these are the only three options. So you could convince someone of that pretty easily. Number two, we would say, well, Jesus did claim to be God. And they might be like, well, yeah, Jesus did claim that. And then we'd say, okay, so that means Jesus was either a liar or a lunatic or the Lord. Those are the three options, okay? Here we've used law one. We had an if-then statement. We asserted if A, then B or C or D. Then we asserted A, so we concluded B or C or D. Now here, this is where the crux of the conversation is, where all the interesting talk happens on the trilemma. We're going to assert Jesus was not a liar, nor was Jesus a lunatic. We're going to assert Jesus was not a liar, nor a a lunatic. And then from that, we can conclude Jesus is the Lord. We're using law eight here. Now I'll go ahead and just type this in. So remember, liar, lunatic, or Lord would be B or C or D. We've arrived at that conclusion. So I'll go ahead and put this up here on the third one, B or C or D. Okay. Um, So that's what that would look like on three, B or C or D. And then on four, we are actually going to say, well, Jesus was not a liar, or a lunatic. And so for this, the the proper way to do this is to say a negative sign and then put your parentheses in and to say uh, B or C. This is important, or not D, B or C. This is important to, to do this this way because if you say not B or not C, that's actually implying something different, okay? Now, it takes a little bit to wrap your head around the difference of that, Um, The idea is that, well, yeah, God could, Jesus could not be a liar, but he could be a lunatic. And then that statement would still pass. So what we're saying here is not B or C. Another way, an equivalent way to say that would be to say not B and not C. That is equivalent to not B or C. Okay. So that would be the kind of two ways that you could state this. And from that, the the conclusion is Jesus is Lord. Now, this is a logically valid argument. This conforms to the nine laws of logic. But as you can imagine, not everyone agrees on this. There's people who come to the conclusion Jesus is not Lord. He's a liar or a lunatic, or maybe that he didn't claim to be God, or maybe that he didn't even exist. So there's all these different branch offs with this argument. The interesting talk, like I said, hinges on point four. Was Jesus a liar or a lunatic? No, I don't think so. There's a lot of discussion around that. If you want more on the conversation of the trilemma, you can find it in Evidence That Demands a Verdict. This book has a great chapter on the trilemma. It brings in quotations that really help you see the gravity of um, of these ideas. If Jesus is a liar, what does that really mean? It's unconvincing that he would be based on what we have him on record as saying. He's this great moral teacher. How could he be a liar? Then we can go to the the delusional one, the lunatic one, and there's other implications of that. And what would it really mean if he claimed to be God but wasn't? Well, that would mean he's fully crazy. There's no room to think he's just a little crazy. No, that's the craziest you can be to claim that you're God if you're not. So this is the trilemma. This uses our new laws, laws seven, eight, and nine, it uses the new concept of or, and now you have everything you need. You have the nine laws of logic, which is great, which is helpful. I'm going to go ahead and give you a couple examples for you to try to work out on your own here. So um, three examples, two of them are going to be fairly straightforward. One of them is going to be a little bit more challenging. I want to make sure that I don't flash the answers to you on the screen here. 
Let me enlarge this for those who are following along at home. Perfect. All right, I'm going to put it on the screen if you would like to look at this on YouTube. If not, I'll read through them as well, and I'll also put them in the show notes on the podcast so that you can actually read these. It's really helpful to see them and to read them. So example number one is going to interact with the concept of humanism. If you don't know what humanism is, you can look that up. The general idea is humanism elevates humans as being the most important and valuable thing there is. Usually humanists uh, deny the existence of the supernatural, although not always. There are so-called Christian humanists, uh, people who say they believe in God, theistic humanists even, um, who believe in God but do do this thing with humans, elevating them, saying they're the most important. So we're interacting with that here in example one. So Premise one, if God exists, then humanism is not true. Premise two, if God does not exist, then humanism is not true. Premise three, God exists or he does not exist. Premise four, therefore, if God exists, humanism is not true. And if God does not exist, humanism is not true. Therefore, either humanism is not true or humanism is not true. And finally, six, Conclusion. Therefore, humanism is not true. Now, I do want to give credit where credit is due. I got this example specifically from a book called Philosophical Foundations of a Christian Worldview. This is an incredible book. I actually got a lot of what I've been teaching from this book on logic. So if you want to dive much, much, much deeper, you can get this book. It does get used in college level courses, just so you're aware. It's pretty advanced, um, but it could be helpful to, to flesh this out more. This example came from there. I'm indebted to them for my series I've been doing on logic. They've they've helped uh, tremendously, the two authors of that book. So that's example one, humanism. Example two is the example we just talked about. I would love for you to notate that out, the trilemma. I'll go through it one more time. If Jesus claimed to be God, then he was either a liar or a lunatic or the Lord. Two, Jesus did not claim to be God. Or, sorry, (laughs) Jesus did claim to be God. Three, Jesus was either a liar or a lunatic or the Lord. Four, Jesus was not a liar or a lunatic. Five, Jesus is the Lord. I'd love to see you notate that. Now, example three, I also got from Philosophical Foundations. These examples really seemed good to me. So, this is like Clue, okay? We're going to be doing Clue here and seeing uh, if you can figure out who the murderer is. So, One, if the butler was the murderer, then his fingerprints were on the weapon. Two, either the maid or the gardener was the murderer if the butler was not. Three, if the gardener was the murderer, there will be blood on the garden fork. Four, if the maid was the murderer, not murdered, murderer, (laughs) then the master was killed with a kitchen knife. Five, the butler's fingerprints were not on the weapon. And six, there was no blood on the garden fork. The question is, what can we now conclude from this? Now, hold on. You're going to be tempted to skip these examples. You're going to be tempted to say, I, I listened to the teaching. Why do I need to do these examples? Guys, the only way you're going to get good at doing logic is by actually notating examples, figuring out which laws do what, and applying it. I am telling you, you are not going to get the benefit of this series if you don't take four minutes right now, look in the show notes of this episode or the description of the YouTube video or pause the video, get out a piece of paper and notate these examples. You are not going to get the benefit if you do not do this. If you're an adult, you need to do it. If you're a kid, you need to do it. You got to take the time. You got to do your time. Okay. So that's my encouragement to you. Here's three examples. I hope they are helpful in helping you understand these final three laws of logic that we did today. We're going to be moving on from here to some interesting things. I'm going to keep it as a surprise for now, but that is all for this week. Guys, if you've been watching this series, if you've been following along, leave a comment, leave a review. I would love to know if this has been helpful for you. I will tell you, as I've been teaching through this stuff, it has proved tremendously helpful to me already. And I've been a believer my whole life. Yet thinking through the logic of statements and actually, like I said, notating these things out, seeing how they apply, seems like it's really helping me have a better grasp of scripture as I'm reading it. And it's also helping me a lot when I get into situations where I'm 
um, debating things with non-believers. And I'm doing that constantly as a youth minister. And as a Christian, you should be doing that constantly. If I wasn't a youth minister, I'd still be doing that constantly. It's our job. It's our duty to do apologetics, to provide a defense for the faith. And when Paul did that in Acts, it wasn't just thinky stuff. It was often giving his experience for things. But, but it's so powerful to be able to do that in a coherent way. And so I want to encourage you, stick with this. If you're one of the students in my youth ministry, I know that this is challenging and this is new and it's uncomfortable. Stick with it. This will benefit your life for years and years to come. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great day. I'll see you next week.